All right, good. That's great. Cool. So hi guys. Uh, my name is Omar. Uh, I work at TikTok. So uh, I lead a team there, uh, and we mostly deal with payments, which is why we rely a lot on databases, uh, particularly uh, MySQL. We use MySQL a lot. And in this talk, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, InnoDB. It's uh, I'm curious, curious amongst the audience here. Uh, how many of you have heard of InnoDB? Awesome, that's good. And how many of you have used it? Probably everyone, right? Okay, cool, pretty significant, nice. All right, so uh, let me just give you guys a little bit of uh, historical background. What is InnoDB? So InnoDB is a storage engine for MySQL and also MariaDB, which is also technically MySQL. Uh, it, and since uh, MySQL 5.5, which was released 13 years ago, it, uh, InnoDB kind of replaced my ISAM as the default storage engine. But it's interesting to ask yourself, why is, why, how come MySQL has multiple storage engines? And this is an interesting design decision, because from MySQL's perspective, it's designed to be, to work with multiple storage engines. It's, it's kind of, it, they offer this abstraction. So, and different storage engines have different uh, ap applications. So, you can build a storage engine that's kind of meant more for OLTP workloads or OLAP workloads. This depends. So, but but my, you can keep the same kind of interface and some common co components the same. That's, that, that's the design philosophy here anyway. So, okay. So, a storage engine, what does a storage engine do exactly? There's actually two big parts of a storage engine. One is it's going to manage the in-memory structures that basically you need to keep your query, the pages you are querying, and keep them in memory as much as possible, as well as manage the on-disk data structures, right? And InnoDB has a bunch of data structures that they use to make all this work. They also manage your write-ahead log. They'll manage, so there are a bunch of these things. I'm just gonna, I won't have time to go through a lot of things because this is kind of, this talk is kind of a lightning talk. I'll just talk a little bit about the high-level picture. So, as you guys probably know, you guys probably know this, uh, in terms of storage hierarchy, the fastest thing you have is our CPU registers, and probably the slowest thing you have is network storage, right? Because, uh, and, and, and hard drives and SSDs are, are somewhere in between, DRAM is fairly fast as well. Uh, Non-volatile storage in general is, is relatively slow. I think everyone knows that. Uh, it's also cheap. So if you're storing tons of data, you probably want to store it on on uh, non-volatile storage, so, and uh, you probably want it. Want, want, you're probably okay with higher latencies. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides, uh, and this is like there's an upside for this as well. So it's like so I'm a bit of a performance nut. So if you guys are interested in performance, to performance is something you must know. What is uh, the latency for a cache cache uh, hit? If you, if you, so L1 and L2 caches are in your CPU. They're almost as fast as register lookups. Whereas DRAM is around 100 nanosecond. You know, uh, SSD, you can see it's a few orders of magnitude uh, slower, right? And uh, HDD is another few or several orders of magnitude slower. And then network storage, you know, just takes that way out. So if you like convert this to time scales we can understand, a cache is, a cache hit is one second. And compared to, you know, DRAM is 100 seconds, right? And then compared to an SSD is four hours. So if you fetch some data from your cache, CPU cache is one second versus four, ready for four hours. If you fetch it from SS SSD, which is supposedly quite fast. And HDD will be three weeks, right? So, you, so this is something that you must be aware of when designing any system that you know, needs to deal with a lot of data. Okay. Uh, another thing that you need to be mindful of is uh, random access on non-volatile storage will almost always be slower than sequential access. And generally, storage engines and DBs will try to maximize sequential access. And that's how they, that, so they'll try to tune the algorithms because this is the fundamental bottleneck. It's not about uh, algorithmic complexity, it's about making sure everything is sequential, right? All right, so in, uh, the first thing is inside a DB, uh, there's a concept of a page. Because when you organize data, you organize data in, in pages. And the reason for doing this is because when you are writing to a non-volatile non storage, normally the APIs provided are block-based. 
So you will work with blocks of data, right? And that's why to optimize that further, you will want to structure the way you save the data into into blocks because you're only going to save it. So even if you say, because if you save one byte, you're actually saving the whole block. And normally the hardware page is four kilobytes. So you do one one. You don't want to do byte by byte operations because that, then you're wasting a lot of throughput, right? So what databases do is they will organize uh, storage in these pages. The pages can vary in size. Database pages usually will be between 5, 12 bytes to 16 kilobytes. MySQL uses NODB use 16 kilobytes, right? And the way they organize this page layout is uh, they'll have a header in front, tell you some metadata about you know what 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 what's, what's the stuff stuff about this page and bookkeeping. And then usually what they'll do is they'll have this thing called a slaughtering. So this is a slotted page design. So they'll have these uh, kind of slots that are pointers that are pointing to where the actual to tuples that you contain your data actually are, are kept. And the reason for this design is so that it's kind of e easy for you to support uh, tuples of variable length because tuples can have variable length. They're not always going to be fixed length. That's why this slotted page design is used. So another thing about NODB is you need to man, you want to put, keep these pages that I described just now. They are usually will have the same representation on disk and in memory. Uh, you want to keep these pages as much in memory as possible, right? Because like I mentioned, you, you, you want to fetch things fast, right? And, and memory versus disk, the, 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 there, there's a huge uh, difference in latency. So normally what uh, InnoDB does, so InnoDB will use an LRU-based algorithm to keep pages in, mem pages in memory. And the larger your buffer pool is, obviously, the higher speed ups you're going to get, That's, which kind of makes sense, right? Uh, that's also why if you give MySQL some memory, it will never give it back to you because it's going to keep this buffer pool and it want to use it as much as possible, all right? Okay, so how the, just to give you an idea of like how the whole flow actually works, so normally when you send a query, the query will go to this execution engine. The execution engine will decide, will come with a query plan, it'll decide, okay, how should I execute this query, right? And after it has decided, it's going to talk to InnoDB and then it'll decide, okay, uh, I need to fetch the, these pages. This page might be on disk, maybe not in the buffer pool, buffer pool yet. So they'll fetch it from disk, it'll be loaded in the buffer pool, and then, uh, and then uh, the query will operate on that and then send, give the result back to the user, all right? Okay, so uh, one thing about uh, database, about InnoDB in particular, is that it's asset compliant, right? It follows asset. How many of you guys know what asset means? Anyone? All right, cool, everyone knows, all right, that's great. So asset, the A means atom, atom, atomicity, and the key idea here is that uh, either, when you have database, when you have transactions, either everything happened or nothing, nothing happened. You can imagine this is quite important for many applications, uh, you know, the NoSQL movement is quite, was quite hip 10 years ago, and it eventually they also realized, eventually most NoSQL systems add, ended up adding transactions again, because transactions are critical for many, many use cases. So, uh, especially if you're in payments, you can imagine transactions are extremely critical, because you want to make sure if you're having two database operations, either both succeeded or nothing happened. So, and, and we need autonomous city to support that. And uh, yeah, so the way in NeoDB the atomicity works is if you just fire a, a SQL statement without a transaction, it'll be auto-committed, not by default. And you can tune this if you want to. And then for transactions, you also have a commit and they also have rollback statements for you to commit a rollback. Uh, another part about uh, you know, the, the C in asset is consistency, right? So what that usually means is uh, you want to make sure if you write data to your DB, you read it again, you get you get the result right. That's that's consistency. Uh, in InnoDB, you can imagine this can be quite tricky because while you're running, you can crash right. And if you crash while you're running, you will, might lose consistency right. Because maybe you, from the application point of view, you wrote it, but actually you didn't write it write it to the disk yet. So how to manage this? So the way InnoDB works is it manages this thing called a double write buffer. So uh, it's kind of like a backing store. So, so basically, it'll write to that buffer, and then that buffer will write to disk. And if you lose that buffer, it's fine. So uh, they also use write-ahead logs separately to kind of, uh, if you crash, they'll replay the write-ahead log so that you can recover. Uh, so I won't go into this in too much depth. 
All right. Uh, one other very fascinating area that I'm a big fan of is isolation, the I in acid. So isolation, what does isolation mean? Uh, it actually controls the extent to which a transaction is exposed to other concurrent transactions, right? Because if you think about it, uh, you, you can have the simplest database possible, which is just single threaded, and it, it, it doesn't need to, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't need to do anything. It, if you have a single threaded uh, database running on one core, and then you just fire, give it a query, and then it, it, basically you don't need any locks, you don't need to do any protection for concurrency, right? This model can work, and actually there are some databases that do that. So Redis is quite famous for doing that. There's also WallDB. It's also designed with the same idea in mind. So, however, the problem is that you also lose a lot of concurrency. Concurrency for databases, especially those that deal with disk, is quite important because you don't want to, if you're only running a single thread, you'll be spending a lot of time spinning, uh, waiting for disk I.O., right? So we want to maximize a lot of concurrency, especially on modern hardware when we have a lot of cores, right? Uh, the problem, however, is when you have concurrency and multiple transactions ongoing at the same time, and they're all operating the shared buffers, and this shared storage, you want to, there's a lot of interesting problems that will happen. For example, you write something, your transaction is ongoing, and you read some, you, you, someone else writes some, wrote, wrote to the same object that you're supposed to read, and you'll get a dirty read, for example, right? Or you might get, you might have unrepeatable reads, you might have phantom reads. I won't go into the, these concepts in too much detail uh, because we don't have much time, but feel free to talk to me more about this afterwards, right? But isolation levels, Isolation is a very, very important. And uh, in, in ODB, there are four isolation levels. Uh, and it's very important for application developers to understand which one to use and what makes sense because this decision is left to the application, right? Uh, so the strongest level is called serializable. It is essentially, the, the guarantee here is, it's, uh, is that it is as if the transactions were executing one by one. However, in actuality, they're not. In actuality, they will implement two-phase locking to, to still allow concurrency, but they, they, the, but the, the, so there will be still some concurrency, but, and the, but the, the database, NODB will guarantee that the results you get are, are, are correct. Uh, the default level in NODB is actually repeatable read. Repeatable read does have an issue that it actually, uh, you might get some phantom reads. Uh, that, that can happen, uh, but, but that's the default. The reason for doing repeatable read is it's better for performance, right? Because with serializable, uh, you, you basically you need to do a lot more locking, right? And it's, your performance is going to suffer. Uh, it's recommended if you, it, if, you can, if you can't live with phantom reads, you should do serializable. By default, most people don't. Most people use a repeatable read. Most, and the, one of the interesting things about this is that this is not something that's that visible. Like, you probably wouldn't notice it. Unless you dive into your data and you see, oh wait, some maybe the data doesn't add up, or something, something, something went wrong here. So like phantoms, well, one, one, a few places. So a, a phantom. But what I mean by a phantom is you have a transaction and you, you, you collected some processing some objects, and then, and then while you're running your transaction, someone else inserted a new object that matches your criteria, right? So, so, so that's this kind of thing can happen, right? Okay. Uh, read committed is another isolation level provided by uh, NODB, where, where it's the performance is better, but uh, once again, this will uh, one uh, it also allows for phantoms. It also allows unrepeatable reads. Unrepeatable reads is like you might have these flashes where you might not get the same read again. This is because someone else mutated that data. Whereas it's an repeatable read. Normally, they'll use some snapshots. So they'll copy over and have different versions of the data. But in repeatable, in read committed, they'll actually be touching the same, same, same data. And uh, read uncommitted is like basically anything can happen. It's basically MongoDB. Like, like basically, you don't get any transaction isolation, right? So any of these problems can happen. And this, uh, I mean, if you're using this, then you might want to reconsider why you're using MySQL. All right. Uh, yeah. Um, then uh, let's quickly talk about durability because I'm almost out of time. So uh, for so as I mentioned, as I talked, to, I mentioned earlier, uh, NODB has a double write buffer. Uh, this kind of it's one of the it, 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 this helps us to get durability because it's double the double write buffer is a storage area where NODB will flush the pages because you remember there's a buffer pool and the way NODB writes is when the page is dirty it will write that page to disk. So uh, if 
and, and then the AI has a double write buffer to kind of help you manage that and help help you recover uh, from recover from uh, because we actually write it twice. They they write the double write buffer and they also write to the actual 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 page. But one of the nice thing is that uh, there is some optimizations to kind of minimize the cost of repeated repeated f syncs. So you don't need to actually f sync multiple uh, f f syncs will not be as expensive because uh, you can do you can you can batch everything into a large sequential chunk. Uh, with that, I'm out of time. Just nice. So, do you guys have questions? Hello. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, if there are any um, main differences of InnoDB engine from other engines, mm -hmm. or it's just uh, uh, may, very many small things, small optimizations that makes NADB engines better than others in some way. Right, what is the secret? Yeah, right, you're comparing to MySQL engines, or you're comparing to like any other storage engine? Uh, same MySQL engines. Right. Uh, there is a huge difference. So, especially so, so my ISM, I believe, uh, tries the the philosophy there is quite different. It's not as optimized for OLTP workloads in particular. That's my understanding. Whereas NODB is very much targeted towards OLTP. Kind of small transact, small transactions, but lots of them. So, mm -hmm. so the, the, this does. There is a huge, huge difference. The code base is completely different, and the, the design and architecture is also completely different. So, if you compare uh, InnoDB to other uh, database engines, uh, it's like so, so. Like for example, Oracle. Uh, Oracle DB has the Oracle has their own storage engine, for example, uh, and uh, what you call the, the, the uh, DB2. Uh, from IBM has their own storage engine. Compare, uh, if you compare InnoDB to those guys, I mean, they're similar in architecture, definitely, but, but uh, those guys, because they're enterprise, they'll be much more, they'll have much more performance guarantees because they can they spend a lot more engineering manpower. This is because InnoDB is open source, so it doesn't get that much love. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So I guess one of the other popular engines that's coming up in the bicycle world is uh, MyRox or Rox. Yes, yes, that's a good one. So yes, how I do like you that. contrast the right. two? That's a great point. Uh, so RoxDB uses LSM trees, uh, which is different from my, the standard B tree uh, mechanism that's used by InnoDB. It's a pretty good, interesting to contrast them both. One of the things I know is uh, my Ro RoxDB is optimized for uh, store this space, space because it so. For a, they get they, they can basically the, the trade off is you may get slower reads, faster writes, and you need less uh, less disk space to store the same amount of data. However, some certain types of queries are a lot slower in in Myrox, so you have to do the trade off a bit, a bit carefully. So we use Myrox in situations where we have a lot of data and we want to optimize on disk space. That is, so Myrox is pretty good for that. Yeah, yeah, hi. Uh, understand that uh, uh, the InnoDB storage engine is optimized for handle transactions for yeah. RTP workloads. Yeah. So let's say when there's a growing, huge growing workloads, hmm. then uh, like you need to handle, let's say, uh, 100K TPS, yeah. you need to handle, for example, 10 ter 100 terabyte of data. Yeah. How do you do that with InnoDB storage right. I engine? Mean, I mean, so, so if you, it depends, if you're bottlenecking on a single machine, you need to shard it, right? So you can't, obviously, this is, obviously you can't get, especially if you have a heavy transactional workload, you probably can't get that much TPS uh, in one machine. So generally the idea would be you, you shard it. And then you, there are solutions for sharding. There's open source solutions. Like for example, uh, uh, YouTube had one, I forgot the name. Uh, the open, yes, Vitesse, Vitesse. So Vitesse is pretty good for that. We have, in our company, we have our own internal one. So I think most companies have, will do sharding of some kind. Well, that's all the time we have now. So I guess this is the most important time of the day, I guess. It's lunch. So thank you, everyone, for joining this morning.